Hello everybody, so my name is Courtney Woodka. I'm the new development coordinator at the Steelworks Museum. And today I'm going to speak on how the museum came to be, current projects, and what we are doing, um, working on in the future of where we hope to be. But first, a brief history. <clears throat> From the 1870s until the 1990s, Colorado Fuel and Iron served as a major corporation in the development of the American Industrial West. CFNI operated more than 60 mines up and down the Front Range, an administration complex, as well as steel production facility in Pueblo that produced steel and iron products that were sold around the country and eventually the world. Fast forward to 2000 when a group of Puebloans formed the Bessemer Historical Society to preserve the rich industrial history of steel and iron. This group had a tremendous feat ahead of them, attempting to organize thousands of documents from x-rays to payroll records. Shown here are a few pictures to let you know what they had to work with. The Steelworks Museum is housed in the former CFNI Medical Dispensary, built in 1901, and is located in Bessemer. Off of I-25, take exit 97A, turn left on Abriendo, and continue and turn left into the parking lot. Admission is free for members, $6 for adults, and $4 for children ages 4 to 12. The museum features exhibits related to all facets of CFMI's history and its impacts on the American West. While there, you can learn about coal and iron mining, steel production, the railroads, and so much more. There's also traveling exhibits like the company store, which provides a glimpse into what life was like back then. Chris Dreck is the museum's archives manager, and he is currently the interim executive director. In January 2003, the Bessemer Historical Society, now Steelworks Center of the West, received a donation of vast archives from the Colorado Fuel and Iron Company from Rocky Mountain Steel Mills, a division of Everett Oregon Steel. The Steelworks archives include over 5,000 rolls of microfilm, 100,000 photographs, over 228 motion picture films, 30,000 maps and drawings, thousands of financial ledgers, 25,000 blueprints, and internal publications such as the Camp and Plant, the Industrial Bulletin, and the Blast. Our archives represent the life and economic development of Pueblo and Southern Colorado. A great example of this is the typewriter repair room, frozen in time, in the Annex building's basement. Left untouched since CFNI's closure, it's almost as if the workers are all at lunch and will come back at any moment. The archives also include artifacts from way back. There is an entire room of wooden patterns that were built for molds to pour steel into to make gears and other steel items. Access to the archives is by appointment only. Do you have an ancestor who worked at CFNI? Chances are we have their records. Are you interested in searching for records and helping others? Volunteer, volunteers help us tremendously. Victoria Miller is the museum's curator and educational programmer. The museum offers a one-of-a-kind resource and educational experience for students and teachers. Programs are designed to meet and exceed Colorado State education standards. Guided school tours of the museum incorporate hands-on activities for students. A popular program at the museum is Free Science Saturday, which includes a variety of hands-on experiments to create an informal science learning experience for no cost to attendees. From dissection of animals to elephant toothpaste, each program focuses on family learning with STEAM themes. As I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, I'm the new development coordinator. The Steelworks Museum is currently developing many programs and fundraisers, including a paranormal activity night in April. Are you a current college student in PCC or CSU Pueblo? you can get into the museum for free. Some of you may be familiar with Saints and Sinners. The eighth annual Saints and Sinners is right around the corner, next Saturday actually, and this year features a presentation by PCC history professor Brad Bowers. Attendees will enjoy burrito breakfast and receive a booklet full of information about the churches and taverns on the tour. Tickets can be purchased on our website. Faces of CFNI is in its 12th year and will be held February 2018. Last year, David Rockefeller Jr., grandson of former CFNI owner John Rockefeller, was the keynote speaker. This year features a trip back in time to hear from Harry S. Truman and his trip to Pueblo in the 1940s. You won't want to miss it. The Steelworks Park project began in 2011. Now, in 2017, the park is almost near completion. 
Placed directly behind the museum, the park features commemorative bricks noting years of service of past employees, artifacts from the mill, and park benches. Special thanks to the Levert Hogue Foundation, CDOT, and Black Hills Energy for making the park happen. Recently, artifacts from CFNI made their way to their final resting place. They include a yellow Davenport engine, also known as a dinky, a 130-ton ladle, 10-ton ladle, ore carts, rail rollers, <coughs> Mine Rescue Car Number One and the Jewel of the Park, an oversized sculpture of a still worker. So, what is the future of Stillwork Center of the West? Where do we go from here? The administration building is the future home of the museum. It will feature three floors with meeting and event space, as well as more history about CFNI. The capital campaign for this endeavor is set to kick off within the next five years. In 1990, Colorado Fuel and Iron filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy. Buildings were abandoned, workers clocked in and out for their final shifts, and buildings were destined to become ancient artifacts and grow into the background of emerging foliage. That is, until 1993, when Oregon Steel purchased CFNI, naming it Rocky Mountain Steel in 1998. While parts of CFNI still remain desolate and a perfect place for wildlife to roam free, in 2006, Everest Steel purchased Oregon Steel Mill Holdings. Today, Evers operates four manufacturing facilities, steel making, rail mill, rod and bar mill, seamless pipe mill, and an advanced technology center. Steel is and always will be an important part of Pueblo and its history. For more information about our events, the Steelworks Park, Museum, and, Ar and Archive Services, or have a volunteer, you can visit our website at steelworks.us. We're also on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Thank you. thrilled to be here. We think the path to a better future and getting more from life is frugality. We can work less, have more free time, be more content with what we already have, and find joy in the simple things in life. 501 years ago, Thomas More wrote Utopia, describing an ideal society. Here's an illustration of Utopia from the original book. Such an ideal place may not be possible, but this shouldn't stop us from trying to create a better world. Our vision of this best future world is a harmonious civilization where our personal priorities are in balance, our relationships with others are fair, just, and equitable, and we maintain our home, Earth, with care. It is paradise. If our planet's delicate biosphere is going to be able to sustain us, we must learn to live more simply. To survive, thrive, and be free, what we need are lifestyles that are less about consumption and more about savings and health. We all want happiness. Is making lots of money really the best way to get it? It isn't money that's making these children happy. A poll of 143 countries found that the happiest ones are not the richest ones, and that there is little connection between material success and happiness. In many of the unhappier countries, people are pressured at the workplace to work harder and spend more hours there. In Japan, there's a big problem with people actually dying from overwork. They even have a word for it, Hiroshi. Time is far more precious than money. We all run out of time. To get more free time, we must spend less so we can work less. One fourth of adults in the U.S. are in debt. They owe more than they have. We think overspending is the main reason. There is a way out of this. We can have a different definition of success. One that is measured not in money, but in learning adventures and health. Instead of consuming stuff, we can consume ideas and experiences. We must have savings though. Without it, we're either broke or we're in debt, and we're slaves to our jobs and creditors. Overusing mortgages, loans, and credit cards is what puts us into debt. Earning more than we spend is what gives us savings and freedom. To be free, we need savings, 
but we also need to be healthy. What good is wealth without health? If we pay attention to and take care of our bodies, our most precious material possessions, then we'll be more free because healthy bodies can do more. We've spent so much time and focused so much of our attention on consuming things that we forget to take care of our bodies, the vehicles that take us through this life. These vehicles of ours are the only ones we get. We can get more out of life if we have bodies that are in balance, that are active, and that are fueled by wholesome ingredients, and minds that are focused on self-care and self-improvement, instead of on consuming things. Our affluence has given us many new toys to sit and enjoy. These can be fun and even educational, but sitting too much means weaker bones, loss of coordination, balance, and strength. The air, drinks, and foods we ingest are also often far from ideal. Instead of sitting so much, there are many things we can do that don't cost a lot to keep ourselves moving and off the sofa. Our favorites are yoga, walking outside in nature, and tennis. Also essential to our health is the air, water, and food we consume every day. We must drink enough pure water. It's <coughs> vital to us. We drink water filtered by reverse osmosis. Some grocery stores have it and it's cheap. Here's Carmela refilling water at Walmart. Herbs as a tea or as a spice also help us to stay healthy. We need pure food too. It's our fuel. That means organic whether we grow it or get it from a local farmer or store. The left photo is our garden this spring. The best way to refuel is to eat nutrient-rich foods. They're all delicious when prepared right. Here, we're about to float down the river. Here, we're recycling. And here are my folks with garden cucumbers. We'd be happier, more productive, and Earth can stay livable if we live simply, be less wasteful, and more self-aware, playful, and resourceful. Everything we've just discussed is in our new book, Frugal Utopia, Savings and Health, including an interview with my frugal parents. It also has 103 frugal tips, things like time and stuff management, free or cheap entertainment and info, do it yourself and bargain also things like discount heat, transportation, living arrangements and housing, and fitness and healthy eating. What the book is really about is how savings gives us freedom and how health does. After the show, we'll have books for sale. We'll be glad to sign it for you. We're asking $15. We take cash, check, and IOUs. We also have free bookmarks, and if you want to find out more, a handout with every source we used in our research of the book. Thank you. We hope you'll stop by. Good evening. My name is Mary Hammer. I'm the Executive Director of Junior Achievement for the Pueblo District, and I'm here to talk to you about what Junior Achievement is and why JA. Our young people are facing many challenges and they need our help. Junior Achievement provides young people with the real world skills that they need, like how to manage and how to prepare a career, or how to run a business. Students connect classroom learning to the real world, allowing them to recognize. According to the Department of Education, one in five students will not complete high school. A recent survey by the Manpower Group found nearly all half of employees and employers recognize that talent shortages impact the ability to serve customers. The Jumpstart Coalition for Financial Literacy found that 36% of Americans say that their financial uh, debt is higher than it should be. According to a study on high school dropouts, a primary reason that the students drop out of school is that they fail to see the relevance of what they learn in the classroom and how it relates to their future. Teachers and volunteers agree that junior achievement programs connect what is learned in the classroom to the outside world. The four C's of critical thinking are essential to help students take what they learn in school 
and apply it in life and workplace setting. JA programs and the engagement of our volunteers help students better understand the importance of these skills to be more productive members of the workforce once they become adults. JA's programs accomplish all of this by focusing on three pillars, entrepreneurship, work readiness, and financial literacy. It's JA's belief that these concepts are critical in providing young people with the ability to take advantage of opportunities that achieve a better life for themselves and their communities. JA has enlisted outside evaluators who have conducted more than 60 independent studies of JA programs. JA's proven results are teamwork, problem solving, decision making, interpersonal communication, and critical thinking. One of the key elements of JA programs is that they are delivered by volunteers from the community, usually as a part of an employee volunteer programs with local businesses. Not only does this benefit the students by giving them access to role models who can inspire and prepare them for the future, but it also benefits the employees and their employers. Um, you like number two? JAUSA reaches more than 4.8 million students per year in over 209,000 classrooms in all 50 states. Last year, the Pueblo District of JA volunteers presented 311 classes of JA impacting over 6,800 students in our community. This is JA worldwide. Globally, we serve over 10 and a half million youth annually. Our program materials are self-contained kits. They're hands-on, they're experiential, they are visually appealing, they have easy to follow lesson plans for even the most novice of volunteers, they're digital training and environment and blended learning programs for those who wish that, and each student gets a certificate of achievement who completes a program. We have two methods of implementation. There's the traditional weekly classes, which cover elementary, high school, and middle school in a variety of grades and uh, interest areas. And then we have um, what's called a JA in a day. These all cover um, all of the lessons that you see there. A JA in a day is focused at elementary and middle school level. Entire JA programs are delivered in one day to all students. It requires only one day of volunteer time. It inspires youth with your job and your experiences. And sponsorships are available for companies who would like to adopt a school or provide volunteers and fund materials. So again, why JA? Because if you believe in their dreams, so will they. <laughs> because life's lessons shouldn't be learned after it's too late. Back to that 36% of Americans have made that mistake and been in debt. Because nobody becomes an entrepreneur, an engineer, or scientist, and because tomorrow's leaders need today. Because life's money lessons are learned after it's too late. Did we go back one? Again, if, if kids do not have engineers, scientists, or technology in their lives and people inspire them to do this, if they don't have those role models, how are they going to learn? Be that volunteer. Come see us. And there's nothing wrong with doing mechanics, things with your hands, carpentry, and the industrial arts for a living. That takes math, science, skill sets that kids have to learn and be prompted to learn while they're in school. Show them what's possible. Show them you can become a JA volunteer. We align with all the state standards and common core, so we're not extracurricular to teachers. We are supplemental to the things that they have to present to the students anyway. We have an entire document online that teachers can search to help make them connection with what they're going to do. 
Because when students make the connection between what they learn in the classroom and the future of the success, and that's what we do. We try to teach them what they're learning in the classroom. <coughs> this is where it's going to apply. It's the reverse mapping that we're trying to show the kids to get them interested in careers and future and achievement. And again, why JA? Because if you don't, who will? Show them what's possible. Come volunteer for JA. Come help us finance or fund a program. Little contact information. We'd like you to empower the future. I have informational sheets in the outer lobby that tell again kind of a recap of what junior achievement is. And there are some volunteer forms that if you'd like to fill out and get back to us, we'd be happy to screen you through the school systems as a junior achievement volunteer and train you on what it is it needs to do. Thank you very much. Good evening. Pope Oak Free Thinkers is a secular community. If you're a non-believer, skeptic, naturalist, agnostic, avoid a label, or it just doesn't matter whether or not there's a God, you are not alone. We believe in good without a God. Be good for goodness sake. Ours is an alliance of rationalists who think for themselves. That's why we call ourselves Pueblo Free Thinkers, or PF for short. The pansy is the symbol for free thought. Its name comes from the French, pensée, which means thought or idea. Free thinkers encourage you to think for yourself, rather than what someone tells you to believe. Our slogan is, be bold, think for yourself. Our group became a chapter of the American Humanist Association because humanists and free thinkers cherish values such as honesty, integrity, and equality. We believe in being just, fair, and kind to all. We believe in actively doing good works. Our members volunteer individually in community projects as well as global issues, but free thinkers also work together in some efforts to make positive changes. Most of us are everyday people. Many are well known. Millions are well known. In the top row, you'll see Alice Walker, the author, Bill Nye, the science guy, advice columnist and activist, gay activist Dan Savage. On the bottom, Dr. Benjamin Spock with his baby, author Joyce Carol Oates, and writer activist Gloria Stein. We're non believers, but we're not militant. We don't believe in shaming or vilifying those who believe in a god or gods. We believe in separation of church and state. Have you heard the good news about science and reason? Freethinkers don't want other people to try to convince us what to believe. And we don't try to persuade others that they should give up their religious beliefs. Along with millions of believers, we believe in the separation of church and state. President Thomas Jefferson is the one who called it the wall between church and state. He also affirmed Christianity neither is nor ever was part of the common law. Question with boldness even the existence of God. He said if there were, the God would re respect reason more than blindfolded fear. President Adams declared the government of the United States is not in any sense founded on the Christian religion. Madison said, Religion and government will both exist in greater purity the less they are mixed together. That's Epicurus. And he said, Is God willing to prevent evil but not able? 
then he's not omnipotent. Is he able but not willing? Then he's malevolent. Is he both able and willing? Then whence cometh evil? Is he neither able nor willing? Then why call him God? Free thinkers enjoy learning from ancient and modern thinkers. The focus of that pursuit is to exchange ideas through intellectual discussion about a range of topics using logic and reason to learn and make decisions. We host programs at least twice a month with a speaker or video and discussion. We also enjoy social activities, hosting events, and networking with other like-minded individuals. We believe in having fun. So let's have a moment of science. <laughs> we free thinkers hold that knowledge should be grounded in facts, scientific inquiry, and logic. And our dis discussions are quite lively sometimes. We don't often talk about religion. But Carl Sagan said, in some respects, science has far surpassed religion in delivering awe. How is it that hardly any major religion has looked at science and concluded, this is better than we thought? Earth, sun, and stars all round. Who knew? The astrophysicist Neil deGrasse Tyson echoed Dr. Sagan's sentiments. I remember his saying that scientists really are inspired by the mystery of the universe around us. We all have others who inspire us. Two of my late friends who you might have known were Anna Tausik and Pat Spar, a liberal and a conservative, and both atheists. Both were well respected in the community and contributed much to Pueblo and beyond. Kurt Vonnegut was one of the leaders in the humanist movement, and he believed that why should we have to have a promise or a threat to behave? Just for some promise of an afterlife, we should enjoy life now. Our table is by the elevator, and we have plenty of free literature for you. We also have a sign-up sheet if you'd like to get more information to be added to our email list. And we just launched a Facebook page. We have a meetup, and we have our own website, as you can see. And you don't have to write anything down. We have the information at our table. Thank you. services here at PCCLD, and also a District 7 school board member. Over the past year, the library has done a lot of work to enhance our existing partnerships with the school districts, as well as create new ones with charter schools and higher education. Our big initiative over the past 12 months has been launching the Connect Ed program. President Obama announced this program in 2013 which should put a library card in the hands of every child in grades kindergarten through 12. Throughout various communities in the United States, luckily Pueblo is one of the chosen communities. The Connect Ed program is through the Office of Educational Technology and aims to connect 99% of students across the country to broadband by 2019. It also will empower teachers with the best technology and training through rich library content and resources. In 2016, a conference made up of library and school leaders, as well as government officials, was held at the White House. 16 communities were represented, and our library director was able to attend. The discussion was how these library cards would be implemented in different communities. So we began working with Pueblo City school leaders. With board approval and parents' permission, we took student data and loaded it into our library system. Approximately 17,000 students from 29 schools were given library cards, which doubled as their student ID number. We had a similar process with District 70. We added 8,000 student records from kids at 20 schools to our library system. So in the fall of 2016, we gave access to library materials to 25,000 students in Pueblo County. 
So what can a student check, check out with their Connect Ed card? A lot. They can check out books, audiobooks, music, DVDs, magazines, and puppets. If a student returns an item late, they won't receive a late fee. We think of this as avoiding a barrier so students will be able to check out more materials. Besides just checking out physical materials, students also have access to the library's online resources. We have subscription databases to use for research, as well as entertainment with downloadable and streaming movies and music, ebooks, and e audiobooks. Besides Connect Ed, there are other ways that the library is working with the schools. Our Youth Services Department can provide teacher assignment assistance with our resources for special projects. You, teachers can also book a library visit at any of our library locations, and we give out entire sets of classroom copies. Every year for the All Pueblo Reads program, we pick a school-age companion book. This year, to match Station Eleven, we chose I Survived Hurricane Katrina from the very popular I Survived series. We are now giving out 3,200 copies to 128 um, different classes. After we implemented Connect Ed in the school districts, we began to focus on the charter schools. We started with Pueblo School for Arts and Sciences and added 650 of their students. Next, we plan on working with Cesar Chavez and Swallow Charter Academy. Another connection between the library and schools is the various contests we hold throughout the year. To me, the most important one is our Most Improved Reader Award. Library staff get to visit elementary school assemblies and award the children who have made the greatest strides in reading over the past year. We have also begun collaboration with CSU Buffalo. We house a small collection of popular material in their library, and their staff hands out library cards to students and faculty. They are also able to place items on hold and have items sent to them. Once we saw what a success it was with CSU Pueblo, Pueblo Community College showed interest in having a similar collaboration. So we did the exact same thing with them and launched library at PCC last winter. It's a different campus than CSU Pueblo, but it's the same premise. The material being checked out at both campuses is to provide students with entertainment options that they wouldn't normally find in their own academic libraries. Both CSU Pueblo and PCC staff and students have responded positively to this, and we hope to hand out even more library cards. Another exciting project we've just begun is working with the Colorado State Library and Department of Education to help adults earn their high school diploma. The library was awarded 30 scholarships for our community, and we've just begun this project. Students will earn their diploma and not their GED. In addition to that, they will also earn a career certificate in one of the following fields. I could read them, but I'll just let you read them yourselves. <laughs> Potential students must complete an online course and be interviewed by library staff to see if they're qualified for the program. If they're accepted, they have 18 months to complete the program. The library will then hold a graduation ceremony and give them their high school diploma. Before I ran for the school board four years ago, I didn't realize what a natural connection it would be with working at the library. I get to work with many of the staff and students in both roles. I know about things happening in both places, and I get to share that between each other. The library's mission has always been to encourage the joy of reading, support lifelong learning, and give access to information. This year, we've gained a lot of ground with students in Pueblo, and I think that we are doing just that. Wild West. And what else? All right, we've got a live one out there. Very good. Thank you. So let's get going.
My name is Bob Silva. I'm the author of two books, two Western biographies that I have uh, published in the last couple of years, called Lead and Trendad and Lead and Trendad Two. They're about my great grandfather, Louis M. Krieger, who was a lawman in Trendad for over 40 years. Now, what we have here is a beautiful Trinidad court uh, building and jail. What we're seeing down at the bottom, down here at the bottom end, is Arthur Louis M. Krieger, my grandmother, was being held by one of the uh, employees and her brother. That was 18 years difference. Now, my grandfather passed away in 1913, and at that time, there was this article that was written by the Chronicle, and it went on to talk about that he was a manhunter, and along with that, some of his attributes were mentioned in here. The other thing they mentioned was that a book should be written about him. <laughs> okay? So it took a hundred years. Now, these are some of his attributes. So let's get acquainted with uh, the legend of the Southwest. He was known to be deadly with a Coke 45, and this is the only way you're going to survive in those periods. And you have to be accurate, light, lightning fast, and everything else. Now, as we went through the 1800s, you have to give tribute to the frontier families of the 1800s. We wouldn't be here if it wasn't for them. They were strong, hard-working people that we'll never know again. And they came across this God desolate lands and settled in some amazing territory. Now, in 1861 was the Civil War. There was one of the worst wars that we've ever had in this country, some 600,000 men, women, and children vanished. And there was approximately one million that died during this, all for slavery and for state rights. Now, in 1821, what did we have? We have the Santa Fe Trail. And this was started by William Becknell. 1821, him and four other uh, partners started out of uh, Franklin, Missouri, and they loaded up in some horses and they wound up in Santa Fe. That was a big plus. Now, Trinidad, just like Pueblo, started in 1859 to 1861. And this is a photo that we have of Trinidad in 1867. You can see the buildings were made out of the adobe and hardworking folks right in the boardwalk. Well, my grandfather left Missouri right after the Civil War. He jumped on a caravan with the Santa Fe train and wound up in Taos, New Mexico in 1866. In 1867, he went to Trinidad, went into law enforcement in 1871. Didn't take him very long back then to, for him to make a name for himself. 18, uh, December 31st, 1881, three cowboys came in from one of the ranches. They started drinking up the town before you knew it. They were shooting up the town. He confronted it. It turned out to be a gunfight in downtown. One of them went down with three pieces of lead. The other two failed out. As in law enforcement, law enforcement was a very dangerous profession. Your partner and your best partner was your gun, your rifle. This was one that belonged to my grandfather and is still in the family. It's a 30-40 trade. Now, Trinidad was very fortunate. In 1882 and 1883, they had two of the best law enforcement men that you money could buy. Louis M. Krieger, right here, and who else? Pat Masterson was on the other side. They were both marshals of the town. Now, everybody and people here should recognize what we're looking at. It's Old Monarch, the hanging tree, right? All right, where was it? it was from Front of the evening. Exactly. Now, was there anybody ever hung? There's no documentation, but I can tell you there was a couple of uh, rustlers that were hung down on the fountain in 1878 and 1880. Now, there was immigrants that came to this country by the thousands in the, during the 1800s. And there was uh, those that really came to work and make better for themselves. But there was one group from Sicily and Sicilians, and they came to, uh, and created problems. Ladies of the evening, if we're talking about the ladies of the evening, they were a real blessing to this country. Why? 
that it showed how to manage money. Okay? And they were good companionships to all the thousands of men. Okay? Now, here we have the set of keys that represent the keys that belong to my great grandfather. My grandmother gave them to the Santa Fe Trail Museum in Trinidad, and they are and represent one of the finest lawmen that served through the Model Estate. Well, it was uh, 1869, and the Transcontinental Railroad joined tracks in Promontory Point, Utah. It joined the Central and the Union Pacific, and after that, you can see slow chugging locomotives throughout the countryside. Well, what do we have here? What we have here is we have a bar. A bar was a dime a dozen in those days. And what went along with the bars? Rotten gun whiskey. Why rotten gun whiskey? Because there was no regulations on it. Okay? So we went from the bars to the gambling. Now we have a couple of things that we're talking about. We're talking about the saloons. We're talking about the whiskey. And now we're talking about gambling. Now, what's the fourth thing you're going to get in there? You're going to get fights, and next you're going to get gunfights. This was part of the Wild West. Later in Trinidad, Hollywood made the best of this and made it a moviegoer's delight because they really built up on the gunfights on the streets. But there wasn't that many other than my grandfather was noted for the one he had. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Ryan Maddock, and I'm the CEO and co-founder of Easy Protein LLC. So tonight, I'm going to be talking about the benefits of protein and my journey as an entrepreneur. So why do we need protein in our diet? So the thing is that protein are building blocks for life. So in every cell in our body, we need protein. So, so the basic structure of protein, they're made out of um, amino acids, chains of amino acids. And so why we need protein is we need to rebuild our cells um, as well as create new ones. So you find protein in your hair, um, in your nails, um, as well as um, in enzymes and hormones. So mitochondria, so what it is, is it's, um, so they're energy centers pretty much for your fats, your sugars, and your proteins. So what they do is um, they actually send energy, they actually send energy to your muscles and to your, to your muscles and to your brain. So the thing is that if you're not getting enough uh, mitochondria in your cells, what's gonna happen is you're gonna age more. Um, so essentially, uh, so essentially if you're not, uh, so if you're not exercising properly, you're not getting a good diet, um, what's gonna happen is you're not getting enough. So, and so what you need, so essentially how many grams of protein you need. So um, for people, you need actually one third gram of protein per pound of body weight. So let's divide your body weight by three. So all the benefits of protein, so you can attain lean muscle mass. Um, actually, if you exercise more and have a strict diet, um, you're actually gonna, you can slow down aging. You're not gonna stop it, but you're gonna slow it down. Um, as well as you can have a really good build too. Um, so a lot of people, when they get older, all they're doing is they're watching their calories, but they're not watching their protein intake. And so it's essential as you get older, you need a higher protein intake. So the best way to get additional protein in your diet is through a protein shake. So how I started, I really got into the health and fitness industry about five years ago, and I watched the famous uh, pumping iron documentary, bodybuilding documentary, with Arnold Schwarzenegger. And that's how I got inspired to live a healthy lifestyle and really train and exercise properly. So I achieved really great results at a young age because I started working out, um, training twice a day when I was 13. And I really loved the life, I love to eat healthy, I'll have two protein shakes a day, I'll eat really clean meals, and I'll work out twice a day. So that's kind of the lifestyle I like to live, and it's really healthy and beneficial, especially as you get older, you need to exercise more. <laughs> so, however, it's never been easy for me. I had Lyme disease, I had um, mono, I had West Nile, and I had Bertolotti syndrome. So I was sick for two years. So after I started my journey, um, what happened was I was sick, but I battled back. And so during this time period, I got an idea for a coffee machine, but for protein shakes. So just like you make your coffee in the morning every day, this was a protein machine, but it just like you 
just like the coffee machines you love every day, this one makes protein for it. So I bounced back, I came back, I had a good positive attitude, then I entered bodybuilding competitions, um, but my really my true passion was a protein machine, um, just, like you, just like the coffee makers you use and love every day, kind of a curate of protein. Um, so what it does is so everybody has surprised seen a shaker bottle or a blender bottle or even a blender, and they don't make a proper, properly mixed protein shake. So what my machine does is it mixes it up. There's no clumps in it like you get in a traditional protein shake, and it's hassle-free. So this is what I call the easy protein machine. So what it does, so you can hold 72 ounces of water. You're going to get a smooth protein shake. Anybody that's had a protein shake before knows the taste of the clumps of protein in their shake, really nasty taste. <laughs> and uh, so it's super quick, so it just makes it. It's essentially the curry of protein, hassle-free. You can wake up every morning and make the protein shake. So like I said, you've got the shaker bottles, the blenders, prepackaged protein drinks. Um, none, of them are really, uh, are not, none of them are really sufficient for this. Um, so that's why I wanted to come up with a machine that makes it just like your coffee um, that you love every day. <coughs> And essentially, too, the cost um, to make a shake on the machine is way cheaper than buying prepackaged drinks. So right now, for this business, um, we have our trade marketplace for our logo, Easy Protein, um, as well as we filed for our patent application, so that's pending right now. And so this is the world's first ever protein machine. Um, so we're going to get the patent approved probably by the end of the year. Um, so it's pretty cool to have that locally. So our target market, so essentially we're going to go after the fitness, kind of our beachhead into the market, more bodybuilders, serious fitness athletes. Um, then we want to target like the overall fitness market, and essentially want, we want to target an old, older segment of the market because they need additional protein in their diet. Um, and then eventually we want to get to schools and universities. So essentially we're selling our product right now directly to our consumer. Um, eventually in the future, we'd like to get into retail, get to Walmart, big stores like that. And then in the future, um, we'd like to do other partners to possibly have another brand, even possibly a protein brand, um, to go with our machine in the future. So we've done a lot of testimonials. We've done a lot of testing with our machines, put them out there. And uh, we've got some really great feedback so far. Um, so it's really positive, and we've been, uh, we've been working on this a couple of years now. So it's coming along. We have, a, we have about over 100 people that have actually used the machine already. So we have a fantastic team to back this up, this business, Easy Protein. So we have myself, we have my father, he has 25 years experience in project management. Um, we have a great CTO, Chief Technical Officer, John Bukic. He's been in manufacturing for about 30 years. Um, as well as we have my brother from in Fort Collins, and he has a lot of experience with early stage startups. So in addition to our great team, we have an advisory board. Um, so we have a few people to help us out um, since we're starting out with a new startup. Um, so we've got people with global business experience. Um, we have some investors that have been giving us advice, um, as well as we have a partner up in Loveland, Colorado that does all of our product development. So eventually in the future with Easy Protein, we'd like to build up to a level that we can sell it to another company. Um, essentially maybe Curry could acquire us or another big company. Um, and Keurig, they're actually just sold for $5 billion um, not too long ago, and they're in a similar market that we are in. And there, there's so many, actually, uh, Muscle Milk, another well known company there, sold for $400 million. So, thank you for your time. They're in trouble. Their populations are declining. This talk is to tell you a little bit about why you should care and what things we could do in our community about that. Yeah, I mean, you, really. <laughs> right? You know, they get a pretty bad rap. There are no blood eating bats in the Americas. Okay, they all hang out in Africa. So don't worry about it. You can make them look pretty scared if you want to, but really. Um, there are eight species in Pueblo, which is quite a high um, number. Uh, wings have developed three times in the history of life on Earth. Uh, at the top you have our bat wing, our feathered wing, and pterodactyls. None of them are related to each other. They were all uh, completely separate evolutions, which I think is pretty interesting. It seems awfully complex. Anyway, we're interested in the bats, which have been around for about 60 million years. It's the oldest bat fossil we found. 
They're found on all the continents. They fly differently from birds, which is why they have that weird fluttery motion because they use their wings to push themselves forwards and they can move their wings separately, which birds can't do, which is why bats can make a right hand turn in their body length going at 40 miles an hour. Bats, mostly, can't jump and they have to fall in order to fly. So their whole life is upside down, which makes them seem a little strange to us. Uh, one of the reasons juveniles are found on the ground is because when they're learning to fly, they have to climb. This is my favorite cute bat picture. This bat and the saguaro cactus flower have evolved together. The bat has the right shaped face. The saguaro cannot survive without being pollinated by the bat. Cute. Terrific. I love it. Um, there are 1,200 species of bats in the world. Unfortunately, the thing that we're aware of in Pueblo, and there's a good reason for it, is when we see something like this. Eight to ten people a year in Pueblo, thank you, Health Department, uh, are, have, may have been exposed to a rabid bat. And because rabies is such a horrible disease, they always treat for it. One person a year dies in the United States from bat rabies. Don't touch bats. Don't touch any wildlife. They might poop on you the way they did on this guy. But also, they don't like it. Just don't do it, OK? Don't do it. It's a bad idea. And it, it's definitely really bad for the bat because they get killed when they get tested. This picture, thank you, Merlin Tuttle, for giving me permission. This is the most common bat you're likely to see in Pueblo. This is the little brown myotis bat, or little brown bat. And uh, it uh, is one of the bats that has diverse habitats, but it, it, it colonizes attics at times, among other things. This is the big brown bat. Not surprisingly, it looks like the little brown one, but it's bigger. This one is another one that forms nursing colonies at times in attics or walls. Also lots of other places, but they're over 60 million years. Very adaptable, very clever at surviving. This is Townsend's long-eared bat, which is another one that's in, uh, in Pueblo and also sometimes colonizes buildings. Note the ears, guys. We'll talk about great. Uh, the rest of the, the other five bat species from Pueblo um, hang around in trees, under bridges, in caves, um, random roosting places. Uh, are we stuck? I can talk, I can talk. Uh, so bats, um, as I said, they've been around. They're the only mammal that's on all the continents except Antarctica, which is pretty cool. The other amazing thing about, well, there are a lot of amazing things about them, but they get kind of a bad rap in European culture, which is a shame because indigenous cultures value them extremely, and I want to convince you that we should too. How are we doing on that slide, ladies and gentlemen? Um, okay, this is great, no problem. Um, so I will tell you some more amazing things about bats. Their heart rate can go up to as high as 1,200 beats per, per minute when they are chasing an insect. And when they roost, when they're finished with that, it goes down to 350 beats in one second. No human athlete can do that. We need to know more about them, and we don't know much because they're nocturnal, which was their niche in the time of the dinosaurs. That's how they survived. And they're pretty secretive, and they're flying. It makes them hard to observe. So when you read a lot of bat literature, which I did, um, you know, there's a lot of word expressions like, not much is known about their winter habitat, or, we need to know more about this interesting bat. I noticed that. Pros, which gives me more time to talk. So I'm good with that. Just take your time, Sarah. OK, I'm going to propose. I'll talk about it more in the coming slides. But one way you can study bats easily now that was hard in the past is you can do an acoustic survey. And that is done. There's inexpensive. I mean, you can spend a lot of money if you want to, but there is inexpensive bat detection stuff. That means that you can go around and you can tell if there are bats in the area at dusk, even though you may not be able to see them. Very, very cool. Now you can get super fancy ones. 
here is why you need to know about bats. If you don't like bats, you definitely don't like mosquitoes. They can eat half of their body weight per night. They eat thousands. Every little tiny four gram bat eats thousands of mosquitoes every night. Anybody here like mosquitoes? No, they carry West Mountain. So the obvious solution is a bat house. This is what a successful one looks like. See all their cute little faces. There's a problem with that. Uh, you know, a lot of people install them. I'll show you some bat, bat house reviews. And I wish I could say that all you have to do is install a bat house and all our problems are solved. This is possibly the world's most famous bat house. It was built in Florida in the early 20th century. By a guy in Florida, they have really a big mosquito problem. And he had the brilliant idea of controlling mosquitoes by having bats. Great idea, no bat ever lived in it. He tried really hard. This is a review on Amazon of various bat houses, and people, you know, there's 117 reviews. And they said, this is really a great bat house. It's easy to assemble. It was delivered on time. It looks nice. Problem is, most of them are uninhabited. They say, no bats yet, which, you know, it can take a while. Anyway, here's my idea. We've got to learn more so we can find out how to attract them. We need to learn more about the bats in our community because they do us so much good. They reduce the need for pesticide. We can have better organic farming and fewer poisons in our environment. What I'm, this isn't actually, they're not holding up bat detectors. This is less than 50 bucks. The Bat Seeker recommended by our own Nancy Kelly at the Second Chance Wildlife Rescue where she's rehabilitated bats for the last quarter of a century. I will donate one to the library if you know a group that would like to use it on their evening walks. Okay, we can get fancier after that. Uh, this is my joke idea of a classified ad to attract bats to an apartment. I'm saying, you know, a full meal service throughout the summer months, as many mosquitoes as you want to eat, and, you know, the, we can take their poop and use it in gardens. And so I think it's a great idea. We just have to figure out what attracts the bat. Right? This is, Wisconsin has a very good program for bats. Um, and this is one page of a bat survey that was just conducted by ordinary citizens. But they're learning where every one of these kind of bats occur on this 25 mile road. And they're constructing a map. Now they only have six varieties in the whole state. We have 22. I would like to extend my thanks to all the many, many people who helped me with this talk, in, including two of the most famous Batman, Rick Adams, Rich, Rick Adams and Merlin Tuttle. So if you're interested, I want to start a bat society. Sign up with your email address. <laughs> Thank you.